court. What was his response? He refused. He refused that I start the corruption in top level of Afghan state. Mm. It was the reason that he didn't accept my condition. So you left the government? I left the government. In August 2009, Karzai stood for re-election. Voting is underway in Afghanistan's presidential election. Corruption, Dicey. fraud, apathy, and the threat of attacks on the Taliban. The allegations of vote rigging and fraud have been ringing across the cities, the valleys, and the plains of Afghanistan. The presidential election was wreathed in corruption. Ballot boxes were stuffed with false papers. The campaigns of both frontrunners were implicated. Karzai won a second term in office. But for the West, it meant five more years with a partner who'd become a liability and whose state of mind was also ringing alarm bells. President Karzai said to me several times that he suspected uh, the British Army was involved in the drugs trade in Helmand, otherwise we could have ended it. He was sure that if we really wanted to, we could defeat the Taliban in Helmand and we were choosing to keep the fighting going in order to give us an excuse to be there. I mean, it's an extraordinary paranoia. Afghanistan was beginning to look like just another tin pot dictatorship. In America, on the 1st of December 2009, the president announced the results of his long-awaited Afghan review. I want to speak to you tonight about our effort in Afghanistan and the strategy that my administration will pursue to bring this war to a successful conclusion. Increasingly brazen After years of drift, of America seemed to set its compass. It was getting out of Afghanistan, but not before having one last crack at the Taliban. If I did not think that the security of the United States and the safety of the American people were at stake, in Afghanistan, I would gladly order every single one of our troops home tomorrow. To reverse the Taliban's momentum, the generals told the president there'd need to be a military surge. The president sent another 30,000 troops to war. This has taken the total number of troops in Afghanistan to 142,000. What you do, what you do today, you're going to live with that shit for the next 10, 20, 30 plus years. This president decided that once in, he was in all the way, and that he needed to give our commanders in Afghanistan the troops they felt necessary in order to turn the situation around. For the first time, we had, if you like, the, the, the end state quantified in military terms. Mm. Uh, up until then, we'd just been increasing. Uh, bit by bit, with never any clue of when enough was going to be enough. The Americans decided that to secure Helmand, 30,000 troops were needed. The most Britain could supply was 10,000. If the Americans hadn't gone into Helmand, there would have been a strategic defeat for the British Army. Well, there would have been um, an inability to get our strategic objectives secured because the force levels that were required were beyond us. I mean, that's not, I think, quite the same as a strategic defeat for the British Army. It's a strategic defeat for NATO, but the British Army would have done its job magnificently. The purpose of the surge is to clear ground held by the Taliban. Smoke it! Get it, bitch! Oh, yeah, baby! I fucking love you. Do it right, Jack. The Americans want to hand over the whole of Afghanistan to Afghan security forces by 2015. When the surge was announced, the British Foreign Secretary and his special envoy thought this was wildly ambitious. We asked um, a very senior Afghan minister how long uh, the Afghan authorities would stay in Helmand after we left. And um, the Foreign Secretary, David Miliband, was expecting an answer three years, six years, you know, however long it took. Uh, and the answer from this minister, very close to President Karzai, who knows Helmand very well, his answer with a broad grin was 24 hours, Foreign Secretary. 
24 hours. The Americans say that since then there's been much progress from a $12 billion a year training program. Yet they're building an Afghan army and police force whose cost neither they nor the Afghans can sustain. And corruption and drug taking are still endemic, even while on guard duty. Ultimately, as long as the Afghan government lacks legitimacy with the overwhelming majority, its security forces may not be able to hold the Taliban at bay. At the end of the day, if you're going to follow a counterinsurgency strategy, you must be true to its precept. And one of the principal precepts is, in a counterinsurgency, you're only as good as the government you represent and serve. And in this case, it's the government of Afghanistan. That is why the Americans say that US troops will only be withdrawn from combat by 2015 if the Afghans are capable by then of taking over. Not so the British. In May last year, Britain got a new leader. Like the president, the prime minister says he too will withdraw combat forces by 2015. I believe the country needs to know there is an end point to all of this. So from 2015, there will not be troops in anything like the numbers there are now, and crucially, they will not be in a combat role. Unlike the American president, however, the prime minister intends to withdraw from combat by 2015 whether or not Afghan forces can prevent al-Qaeda returning to Afghanistan, even though that's always been the justification for our soldiers dying there. If the assessment, as at the end of 2014, is that Afghanistan hasn't been hardened against the return of al-Qaeda, might that deadline have to slip? No, the deadline is a deadline, and it won't slip. We have paid a very, very large price in terms of the number of young men and indeed some young women that we've lost in Afghanistan, now over 360 people. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're going to maintain public support and backing for what we're doing, it's important to give people a clear idea that there is an end to this. There are lots of domestic political reasons why the Prime Minister has selected uh, that option. And we have committed ourselves as the British Army to uh, deliver against that timeline. Mm. Well, and whether or not it turns out to be an absolute timeline or a more conditions-based approach nearer the time, we shall find out. Ah, so it's, it, 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 it's, it's not an absolute commitment then, that we will get out of combat operations irrespective of the conditions on the ground? It's certainly the intention. The intention, yeah. But things could change. Well, things could always change. I mean, uh, things change weekly in politics, in, in strategic issues. For some time, Britain's special representative to Afghanistan had been arguing the only way out was to start talking to the Taliban. Last summer, Sherard Cooper Coles attended a summit of Afghan experts at Chequers, hosted by David Cameron. Stabilizing Afghanistan isn't a question uh, of pumping in more and more troops or training up a vast national army to garrison the country. It's uh, creating, arriving at a political settlement and then using military force to underpin that settlement but not to deliver it. The simple conclusion that we came to is that uh, most insurgencies down history and around the world have ended in, in two ways. One with some military success but secondly uh, with some political process and solution as well. The new Prime Minister decided it was time to take political risks to start talking to the Taliban. Last February, Washington agreed, something they'd previously opposed. The Americans say a Taliban team, including an aide to the leader Mullah Omar, are now engaged in exploratory talks. But whilst American officials are talking to the Taliban, American special forces are also seeking out and killing many individual Taliban commanders. 
In a typical 90-day period, special mission units kill or capture some 360 targeted insurgent leaders. The Americans say that only this relentless lethal pressure will persuade the Taliban to negotiate seriously. The Taliban say the only outcome will be yet more attacks directed at coalition forces. They consider that the, the continuance of war in this country is not in the benefit of their people. And, uh, but in practice, they are using their military policies, military operations against the Taliban. They are forcing Taliban to, to go towards the military, um, uh, to military response. On a moonless night last month, American special forces set course for Pakistan. Their target, Osama bin Laden, the man the Taliban leadership still revere as the leader of the Islamic Jihad against the infidel invaders. On nights like this one, we can say to those families who have lost loved ones to Al-Qaeda's terror, justice has been done. I couldn't be more proud. It's been a long 10 years. The Americans may have removed bin Laden from the scene, but what of his original objectives? The objective of September 11th was to goad the United States into invading Afghanistan. Then they could destroy an American army in Afghanistan shatter our will at home and lead the United States and our allies to get out of the Islamic world. Bin Laden did provoke the longest war in America's history and the financial cost has become unsustainable, never mind the human toll. <laughs> You're going to say that we kill your women and your children, and that's not true. So what about the coalition's war objectives? They say they've dismantled al-Qaeda's base in Afghanistan, but it's been remantled across the border in Pakistan. We have not succeeded yet in partnering of the state of Afghanistan to ensure that al-Qaeda cannot return here. Ten years ago, we thought we could get in and out quickly. Today, we're still struggling to build an Afghan government that can stand on its own two feet. And now, we're losing patience. I mean, I think no one really understood, perhaps still no one really does understand, the scale of the challenge we've taken on in Afghanistan. Um, we would never, in the 19th century, have created a colony, run it for five or ten years, and then said, it's over to you now. But that's really what our so-called strategy in Afghanistan is. If it's going to take 30 years to stabilize Afghanistan, let the Afghans go through those 30 years of stabilization, because we will never do it. We have not 30 years, but just three years to get it finally right. The armies of the International Coalition are all heading for the exits. Next week, Mark Urban tells the inside story of the bloody five-year battle for Hellman with unique access to the generals and frontline troops who've had to fight it. And seeing firsthand what our troops come up against in Afghanistan, you can catch the last two episodes of BBC Three's documentary Our War on the BBC iPlayer right now. Next year on BBC Two, The Apprentice, you're fired.